Before the dark times, before the Empire, the Galactic Republic flourished, and the Jedi protected the innocent and kept the light side of the Force. This is the clue we need to unravel the mystery of the Sith. The Star Wars prequel trilogy gave us insight into the state of the galaxy before the Empire's reign and showed us how the Republic came crashing down. The first Galactic Empire! Another trilogy means another cast of characters, and it's our job to examine their morality to place them on the spectrum of good, evil, or somewhere in between. Gungans not dying without a fight. We so warriors. To clarify, although some characters' appearances overlap into other movies, we're only considering their actions from episodes 1, 2, and 3. I'm Brad with Wicked Binge, and this is the Star Wars prequel trilogy, Good to Evil. I have the high ground! Let's begin our usual way, starting with the good characters and working our way down. For the gold medal of good, we have to choose the Jedi who displays the most heroism in all three movies, Obi-Wan Kenobi. Hello there. Obi-Wan, fresh out of his Padawan training, has to cope with the death of his master and the pressure of carrying on Ki Gon's dying wish, training the Chosen One. He proves to be a skilled warrior and an excellent teacher, which is incredible, seeing as how Anakin is probably one of the most difficult pupils to train. And you will learn your place, young one. In Revenge of the Sith, Obi-Wan faces his greatest challenge as he's tasked with killing his student and friend who's on the verge of destroying the entire Republic and the Jedi Order. He gives a painful farewell to a dying Anakin and lives on to watch over Luke as he grows up on Tatooine, destined for greatness. I will take the child and watch over him. In the whole trilogy, he defeats Darth Maul, uncovers a clone army being developed for the Republic, kills General Grievous, and actively tries to save the remaining Jedi from Order 66. Execute Order 66. He's a true hero of the galaxy and worthy of the highest spot on our list. Next on our list is Anakin's mother, Shmi Skywalker. It's so wonderful, Annie. You have brought hope to those who have none. Shmi is probably one of the kindest characters in the galaxy, despite her upbringing as a slave. I don't want you to raise. It's awful. I die every time water makes you do it. We see her welcome several strangers into her home during a sandstorm, and she tells Ki Gan about her and her son's situation. Most importantly, we see that she's a loving and supportive mother to Anakin. She cares for her son and wants him to have the life he deserves away from Tatooine. He deserves better than a slave's life. She loves Anakin so much that she endures torture and starvation just on the hope that she will see her son one last time. Now I am complete. Raising a child, especially alone, is one of the greatest things a person can do, and given her conditions, the fact that Shmi is such a caring mother is a feat in its own right. For that, she earns the second place spot of the good characters. Be brave and don't look back. The Bronze Medal of Good is going to Ki Gan Jin. The focal point of the Phantom Menace, Ki Gan is a wise and powerful Jedi Master. It sounds like bait to establish a connection trace. He's far more practical than other Jedi in the series, preferring to exercise his own judgment rather than following orders to the letter. As a result, he's kind of a loose cannon, often doing things without the approval of others. He bets the Queen's escape from Tatooine on Anakin winning the pod race, which would normally be unbelievably risky. And if we lose, you keep my ship. He even cheats on a dice roll to make sure that Anakin is freed instead of Shmi if Anakin wins, although he initially tried to free them both. That being said, Kegon seems to be the only one, aside from Shmi, who realizes how special Anakin is, like the chosen one level of special. I carried him, I gave birth. I raised him. His defiance of the council and wanting to train Anakin only proves that Ki Gan is trying to follow what he believes is the will of the Force, even if his fellow Jedi disagree. Do not defy the council, Master, not again. I shall do what I must do. It's possible he takes matters into his own hands too often. For example, one could argue that he abuses the Jedi mind trick to get his way, but in a world bogged down by procedure and rules, it's useful to have someone who's willing to take action in the face of immediate danger, and Ki Gan is that someone. Up next is our little droid friend, R2-D2. R2 sees a surprising amount of action in the prequels, and he comes around to save the day more than a couple of times. Thank you, R2-D2. <coughs> After every other repair droid is destroyed, he's able to return power to the shields on the Queen's ship during their escape from Naboo. That little droid did it! Right past the main power drive! 
He also helps Anakin pilot a starfighter to destroy the Trade Federation's droid control ship, saves Padme from a lava shower, recovers C-3PO after the Battle of Geonosis, fights off buzz droids and super battle droids in the Battle of Coruscant. Need I go on? This little blue droid is a hero in every sense of the word. Moving on, we have the surprisingly agile Master Yoda, the wisest of all the Jedi. Yoda acts as a mentor to every young Padawan in the Jedi Temple. Use your feelings, you master. He's kind and understanding, but also direct and sincere, which is a different side to him than what we saw in the original trilogy. How did this boy's future is? As far as his actions, he shows up to save Anakin and Obi-Wan, once with the rest of the Jedi in the Coliseum, and again from Count Dooku in a lightsaber duel. He also fights the Emperor to a standstill, but realizes that he will not be able to win and retreats. Into exile, I must go. In the end, he did everything in his power to prevent the fall of the Republic, but the Sith were too strong for him this time. Next is a character who actually does a lot more than people give her credit for, Padme Amidala. She convinces the Gungans to join the fight to defend Naboo from the droid army, and she manages to retake her own palace and capture the Viceroy. Now, Viceroy, we will discuss a new treaty. She also survives several assassination attempts and takes part in the Battle of Geonosis. However, she does a few things that have notably bad consequences for the galaxy. First of all, she votes to remove this sitting Supreme Chancellor, who's eventually replaced by Palpatine. I move for a vote of no confidence in chance of Valorum's leadership. This makes sense in the context of Episode 1, but Palpatine's reign lasts far longer than she was probably expecting, and though she initially refuses him, her forbidden relationship with Anakin is just as much her choice as it is his. I love you. Both of these actions have massive ramifications, although unintended on her part. Bail Organa deserves a mention in the good characters for a few reasons. He spends most of the time trying to de-escalate the war with the Separatists, preferring to seek diplomatic solutions instead of throwing more clones onto the battlefield. You really think that's a wise decision under these stressful times? Of course, he doesn't know that there is a Sith Lord pulling the strings on both sides of the war, but he wants to save as many lives as possible, which is admirable. He also helps Yoda escape from the Emperor and warns Obi-Wan about the clone insurrection. It appears this ambush has happened everywhere. We're sending you our coordinates. For the saga, the most important thing he does is adopt Leia so that she can be instrumental in Palpatine's defeat later in her life. We've always talked of adopting a baby girl. He may not appear very much, but he accomplishes quite a bit for the amount of screen time he has. Our next entry is R2's counterpart, C-3PO. Hello, I am C-3PO, human cyborg relations. We learn in the prequels that young Anakin invented 3PO to help his mother with chores around the house, which is most likely where his pompous and uptight personality comes from. I beg your pardon, but what do you mean? Naked. The reason he's much farther down the list than R2 is that he simply isn't given as much to do. He's always getting himself into trouble. The most he does in The Phantom Menace is help fix Anakin's pod for the race. He also gets Padme to safety while Anakin and Obi-Wan are dueling on Mustafar, but not much else besides that. Master Kenobi, um, we have Miss Padme on board. With that, we close off the light side and enter the more questionable set of characters whose paths are pretty unclear. Let's begin the gray area. Up next is the friendly neighborhood restaurant owner Dexter Jetster. Alright, I know what you're thinking. Why is a character with only two minutes of screen time on the list? So my friend, what can I do for you? Well, in the one scene that he is in, he provides Obi-Wan with the location of Kamino and information about its inhabitants. What you got here is a Kamino saber dart. This is absolutely crucial, because if Obi-Wan had never learned about Kamino, he would have never have uncovered the clone army, and the Republic would have likely fallen much earlier. So in his two-minute appearance, he unintentionally starts a galaxy-spanning series of wars. That's gotta be some kind of record. Other than that, Dex seems like a genuinely nice guy. But how did he know all the specifics of a remote planet just by looking at one poison dart? I ain't seen one of these since I was prospecting on Subterrell. Like I said, questionable. This may be a controversial entry, but we're gonna put Mace Windu in the gray area. The oppression of the Sith will never return. You have lost. As far as heroics, Windu prevents Dooku from murdering Anakin, Obi-Wan, and Padme, and even takes out Jango Fett in the ensuing battle. But for a man who's supposed to be one of the wisest Jedi of all, Master Windu is pretty arrogant. 
He initially refuses to believe Ki Gan when he tells the council about Darth Maul, stating that there's no way the Sith could have returned without the Jedi's knowledge. I do not believe the Sith could have returned without us knowing. He's also very mistrustful of Anakin throughout all of his training, and he makes no attempt to hide it whatsoever. Most notably, Windu tries to execute Palpatine after defeating him in a duel, and would have succeeded if not for Anakin's intervention. Obviously, Palpatine is dangerous, but is it really Windu's place to play executioner? I am going to end this once and for all. It's also against the Jedi Code, something that a sitting Jedi Council member should probably be following to the letter. It's not the Jedi way. He must live. Boss Naz is the very stubborn leader of the Gungans. He has to be mind tricked into helping Ki Gan and Obi Wan get to Queen Amidala and sends them on a quick but incredibly dangerous route when they leave. Risa give you sa the bongo. He then plans on punishing, or more accurately, executing Jar Jar for showing his face in the Gungan city. He seemed to be punished. Naz also has some unfounded notion that the Nabu think they're better than the Gungans, which isn't shown in the film. However, he does ally himself with the Queen to stop the droid army, and declares peace with the Nabu people by the end, so he isn't completely rigid in his leadership. Yet another character with very little screen time, but important nonetheless, we have Supreme Chancellor Valorum. May I present Supreme Chancellor Valorum? His ineffectiveness as a ruler allows the Trade Federation to invade Naboo, and when this matter is brought up in the Senate, he suggests an investigation into the matter, rather than taking immediate action against a clearly illegal invasion. Will you defer your motion to allow a commission to explore the validity of your accusations? This leads to him being ousted and replaced by Palpatine. He isn't exactly corrupt, but if he had just been a more effective chancellor than Palpatine, would not have been able to manipulate the Senate and plunge the galaxy into war. Yeah, we're including Jar Jar Binks on the list. Mr. Jar Jar Binks, Mr. Your humble servant. I know he's probably the most annoying character in the saga, but like him or not, he does some plot relevant things. You saw a big doo doo this time. For one, he helps the Jedi reach Thede and rescue the Queen, and his clumsiness proves surprisingly useful in the battle against the droid army. I give up. I give up. Most importantly, he's the one who convinces the Senate to grant Chancellor Palpatine emergency powers, and we all know what he uses those for by now. Alright, not a, not a great move by old Jar Jar, but given his level of competence, he most likely didn't even know what he was advocating for. Okay, here's the thing about Anakin Skywalker. He changes more than any other character on the list. Really, in the Star Wars franchise. Based solely on his actions in the prequels, he stops an invading force of a planet at the age of 9, saves Padme from an assassination attempt, rescues Obi-Wan from peril at least 10 times, and takes down the Sith Lord who's partially responsible for starting the Clone Wars. I shouldn't have done that, it's not the Jedi way. However, much like Master Windu, this is all thrown out the window once he turns to the dark side. I don't think his slaughter of the Tusken Raiders is completely inexcusable since they tortured and killed his mother for no reason other than savage cruelty, but some of his later acts are just despicable. They're like animals, and I slaughtered them like animals. He nearly chokes his wife to death, kills some younglings, and commits a genocide of all the Jedi in the Republic. Do what must be done, Lord Vader. It's difficult to say when Anakin dies and Darth Vader is born, and how much of his actions can be attributed to Sidious's manipulation. One thing is certain though, Anakin's fear of loss leads him down a dark path that brings death and destruction upon the galaxy. Just help me save Padme's life. However, Padme states with her dying breath that there's still good in him. We all know how that story ends up. There's good in him. For these reasons, I can't bring myself to say that Anakin is completely evil. If anything, Anakin Skywalker is an excellent case of how evil a villain can become, while still being redeemed in the end. Finally, replacing Commander Cody at the far end of the gray area. Cody is a high-ranking member of the clone army who serves under General Kenobi. Come on, when have I ever let you down? The commander helps plan and execute the invasion of Utapau to capture Grievous. He also recovers Obi-Wan's lightsaber and returns it to him after Grievous is killed. Then, not 10 seconds later, Cody's told to execute Order 66 and fires on his friend. Of course, the official lore reason for this is that all clones have an inhibitor chip secretly implanted in them that will allow for the Sith to control the clone army. But this chip is never mentioned in the films, 
So to someone who has not watched The Clone Wars, it really seems like Cody just straight up betrays Obi-Wan on a dime. Yes, my lord. Now that we've finished the gray area, it's time to explore the true scum and villainy of the prequel trilogy. First, let's talk about Sebulba. Sebulba is a pod racer who, as Wado will tell you, always wins. He always wins. When the race actually happens, we see why. Because not only does Sebulba sabotage Anakin's pod before the race, but he also actively destroys other racers' pods during the event. There's no way that someone hasn't died as a result of his cheating. <laughs> Jango Fett is next on the list. He's a bounty hunter who's the genetic template for all the clones on Kamino. And who was the original host? A bounty hunter called Jango Fett. He's also hired to assassinate Padme in Attack of the Clones, but is apparently too busy to do it himself, so he tasks someone else with killing her. When she fails, Jango executes his lackey to prevent her from leading the Jedi back to Kamino. Toxic dot. Jango also apparently thinks it's a good idea to drag his young son to a gladiator arena to watch people get brutally eaten by animals. Not exactly father of the year. Next is the Viceroy of the Trade Federation, Newt Gunray. The Viceroy invades an innocent planet in order to kidnap its queen and force her to sign a treaty that legitimizes the invasion. Ah, victory! He also tries to assassinate the Jedi Ambassador sent to negotiate the end of the Trade Federation's blockade. Despite these crimes, the Viceroy manages to evade justice and rise to power in the Separatist movement ten years later, prompting the Clone Wars to begin. However, we know from the very beginning that all of Gunry's actions are done at the behest of Darth Sidious, so the Viceroy escapes the top five of most evil. Kill them immediately. Yes, yes, my lord. Still, he does get his comeuppance on Mustafar in Revenge of the Sith. At the number five baddie spot is Watto. I'm a Tridarian. My trick's gonna work on me. Only money. What kind of absolute scumbag keeps a slave, then enslaves her child, and forces him to take part in dangerous races so he can bet against the kid? You supply the pod, the entry fee. I supply the boy. A toy Dorian who only cares about money. That's who. Watto's shown to gamble away large sums of cash, and even bet against Anakin, whom he forces to enter the pod races. I'm betting heavily on Sebulba! After not seeing him for a decade, the first thing Watto asks Anakin to do is help track down some people who owe him money. Maybe you could help with some deadbeats who owe me a lot of money. He's just an all-around terrible person completely motivated by greed. Honestly, these next three characters could probably be ranked in any order, but let's start off with Count Dooku. Once a powerful Jedi Master, Dooku betrayed the Jedi Order sometime before Attack of the Clones and became the head of the Separatist movement. The Jedi will be overwhelmed. Dooku is responsible for altering the clone army to accept Order 66 without question, as well as starting the Clone Wars in the first place. Dooku tries to execute a senator and two Jedi by feeding them to wild beast, and he would have succeeded in killing Anakin and Obi-Wan if not for Yoda coming to save them. Patience, Viceroy, patience, you will die. He's also the other Force user we see using Sith lightning besides Palpatine. To Dooku's credit, he does tell a captured Obi-Wan the truth about the Senate being under the control of Darth Sidious, but he leaves out the key detail that Palpatine is actually the Sith Lord. What if I told you that the Republic was now under the control of the Dark Lord of the Sith? Ultimately, Dooku thinks he can follow the Sith tradition and usurp Darth Sidious, but his devotion becomes pointless once Sidious decides he needs a younger, more powerful apprentice. Kill him now. Third place goes to the Supreme Commander of the Droid Army, General Grievous. Although we never actually see him kill any Jedi, that impressive collection of lightsabers has to have come from somewhere. You are doomed. It's too bad they cut the scene from Revenge of the Sith, where Grievous executes Shock T right in front of Anakin and Obi-Wan. At least then, we could see a specific instance of his cruelty. He's not a Sith, but he answers directly to Count Dooku and to Darth Sidious after Dooku's death. It will be done, my lord. Grievous doesn't seem to be interested in the politics of the Separatist, but instead only cares about waging war on the Republic to boost his own power. Sure, he could have been much more intimidating in the film, but he is still an evil warlord, even with his smoker's lung. <coughs> Jedi scum. Our second most evil character is Darth Maul. This is my apprentice. 
Gough Moore. Maul is Sidious's first apprentice, who sent to track down Queen Amidala and bring her back to Naboo to sign the Viceroy Treaty and maybe slay a few missing Jedi along the way. We have to give props to Darth Maul for successfully killing a very important Jedi Master, something we never actually see Dooku or Grievous do. Palpatine may have not been able to manipulate Anakin if Ki Gon trained him instead of Obi Wan, but then again, Palpatine may not have needed Anakin at all if Maul had just killed Obi Wan rather than and taunt him. As many fans know, Maul survives his battle with Obi-Wan, and his story continues in both the Clone Wars and Rebels TV shows, but for now, we're only judging his appearance in The Phantom Menace. At last we will have revenge. That face and those eyes say it all. This Sith is pure evil. And finally, surprising no one, first place goes to Emperor Palpatine. Or should I call you Darth Sidious? Your arrogance blinds you, Master Yoda. Everything that happens in the prequels is according to his design. He empowers the Trade Federation to invade Naboo, trains Darth Maul to be able to kill Ki Gon, sends Dooku to alter the clones to accept Sith rule, takes complete control of the Galactic Senate, orders General Grievous to lead the droid army in attacking the Republic, and manipulates Anakin to become Darth Vader. And we all know how that one turns out. I'm too weak. Oh, don't kill me. Please. Pretty much every bad thing that happens in this trilogy can be directly attributed to Palpatine in one way or another. Windu is probably right in declaring, he's too dangerous to be left alive. He's too dangerous to be left alive. Do you agree with our ranking? Let us know how you'd rank these characters in the comment section. Also, let us know if you'd like to see a video on the Clone Wars animated series or the sequel trilogy. Subscribe for more good to evil episodes on your favorite movies and TV shows. Do it! May the Force be with you. And remember, stay wicked.